You know, when you look at Revelation chapters 2 and 3, the seven churches of Asia, uh, I came to the conclusion a long time ago, I, I have no idea of, of, of really how far one should take this, but it just seems to me that of the condition and the circumstances of the seven churches of Asia, which each of those congregations were written letters individually. And if you've got red letter edition Bible, you're going to find their red letters because it really is a message directed to the churches from the Lord Jesus Christ. That in itself is a unique thing if you think about it. Can you imagine receiving, I don't know how they got the mail back then necessarily, but it was hand delivered, no doubt. Can you imagine receiving? A letter that was addressed to the church at Elgin City, directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. And what he had to say about the congregation. Because his estimation was not just an estimation. His observation and his conclusions would be indefatigable. They would not be able to be denied in any way. I think we get that. But as I look at this, and I love teaching the book of Revelation, I'm going to be doing that here, you know, in a very fairly near future, as we're right now in the second Peter and going through the New Testament. Regardless of one's view of the book of Revelation, you know, dates, you know, is it talking about the Roman Empire, is it talking about Jerusalem, and all of those kinds of things, and we can debate that, and we will debate that until the Calton's cows come home. <laughs> But I'll tell you one thing that we can all agree on better. That regardless of the circumstances that we have in the world, that as the church of God, which we are, as Christians, no matter how severe or difficult the circumstances can be, we must never forget that victory is, our Lord, is in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, that is the main theme of the book. But as I look at chapters 2 and 3 and those seven letters, they serve in some respects, and this is what I'm talking about, how far do we go with this. I think it's an interesting observation, at least, that it may very well serve as a microcosm of the condition of the Lord's church of any day, of any time, of any age. There are those that hold to a continuous historical view. I see value in that, by the way. I'm a preterist from the standpoint I'm a preterist from the standpoint that I certainly believe that the bulk of the book of Revelation has been fulfilled. I happen to take the personal view that the heart of the city, the beast, and the real enemy, the tool of Satan, is the Roman Empire. Not everybody holds that view. All right. I have some very good preaching friends, some very good friends today that believe that it's, you know, Jerusalem. And they hold to an earlier date. I see the point that they're making. They believe that it was written before 70 AD. I don't believe it was written in 95 or 96, but I do believe it was written probably more like about 79 or 80 AD. Commentary I would recommend that you get that a lot of people have overlooked uh, is really well done by an Irish fellow by the name of James McWicken, Jim McWicken, the book of Revelation. I think he does one of the best jobs I've ever seen <coughs> in reference to writing up prophetically the prophets, the, the kings, rather the kings, that John looks back to, that Daniel was looking forward to, and he even shows the disparity between the 8 and the 11. I don't want to get into all that. But he does a fabulous job of putting those kings and history together. And I think it will help you tremendously in understanding the book. But that's just another lesson. When I say a microcosm of the condition of the church in any time, it just seems that no matter what's going on, we know that the church is going to be challenged always by a world that does not love God, a world that does not know God. In fact, by societies that are so anti-Christian, it's just so apparent. And we're seeing it in our society more and more. I almost laugh when people even refer to America, the United States, is a Christian nation. I don't know that it's ever been a Christian nation. I believe with all my heart that the four founders of this country certainly believed in God and they had a variety of religious backgrounds and they have so many biblical references and references to deity and creator and so forth that I appreciate that. But when you want to talk about religious background of our forefathers, it 
was quite eclectic <coughs> variety, and some were deist, as a matter of fact. And so what I'm saying is that we face issues today. They faced issues back then. And when you look at the seven churches, we know that of the seven churches, only two of the congregations were given no rebuke. In fact, were commended for what they did in their faithfulness. And who can remember? We'll turn this into a Bible. <laughs> who can remember who are the two faithful congregations? <coughs> well, I hope you all understand what we're going to talk about. I need to switch this over here. Let's do this. Philadelphia is one. Who was the other one? Smyrna. You're all afraid to say it. But Smyrna. Now, what's interesting is the, uh, five con uh, the seven congregations, two were faithful, five were rebuked. But out of the five that were rebuked, four were given several commendations of things that they had done well, but the adjustments and certain <coughs> changes that they needed to make, and were even told to repent and to do so quickly. One congregation, however, was given no commendations whatsoever. And which one was that? final congregation that was addressed, Laodicea. Laodicea was the congregation that says, you're not cold, you're not hot, but because you are lukewarm, I will spew you or vomit you out of my mouth. Disgusting and intended to be so because of their condition. They thought they were rich, they thought they had no needs, but yet they were blind, wretched, miserable, and poor. And they were screwed up and So it's interesting that as I look at the churches today, congregations, we have a lot of fascinating things that are going on in our own country, not to mention across the world, but even as I try to narrow this down and congregations that I am pretty familiar with, particularly to say in the state of California, we see what's going on and we see the various conditions of congregations and the challenges they have because of what? Because, well, usually because of the lack of leadership, because there has been a difference, there has been a change in the mindsets of people of their view of Scripture. As I talked about even as I did this morning, because some have abandoned the hermeneutic of understanding, of establishing authority. And there are some that have just flat gone so far, may I say spiritually anyway, to the left, that it's troubling. And maybe there are some that have gone so far to the right in their own rigidity have forgotten about what the love of grace and grace of God is too. I think that can be a big problem as well. You know what I'm saying? All right. So much of that overview. What I want to share with you, and the purpose of this lesson is not to present a thorough expose of the sixth congregation of the seven churches of Asia, which is Philadelphia, but rather to immediately explore <laughs> The meaning of a particular phrase in verse 8 in order to challenge you, to challenge us, but to challenge you as a congregation that may I suggest is a congregation in some respects the congregation in transition. Simply by virtue of being a new congregation, not even a year old. A congregation that is a composite, yes, of people that most of you have known each other for a long time. Let's be real honest and frank. A good number of you are family. And I want to say this about that. There's always going to be the challenges in which people will look at that and say, well, you know, there's a lot of family in that congregation. Well, don't you wish in every congregation that any and every family could say, you know, our family happens to take up two pews in that congregation. Wouldn't that be a blessing? Tell me what family wouldn't want that. And so it's not to be criticized unless, of course, that family becomes so dominant that that family becomes controlled. And you know what? I can tell you from a willing perspective, and we have been known to be strong personalities. I wish you would have known my brother and then if well, we have a the father. But I'm just saying that yes, these are things we always have to be careful of, to be very aware of. But when we look at this congregation, and I felt that this would be apropos for what we're doing, to, to really help 
to, to really try to give some observations for this congregation in transition. First, is this a congregation in, in, in transition? And unequivocally, it is. Yes, it is. How so? You have established yourselves in a new location. That's not an easy thing to do. The majority that I see were from the congregation in Glen Burnie. And I've been for a number of years. Even my history goes back to that, to October of 2001. We were supposed to come in September, but we were going to leave 9-15, and there was something that happened on 9-11, 2001. And I'll just say this, that uh, Vicki had never flown in an airplane before, ever. Ever. And she has a phobia, a real fear of flying. And I finally convinced her, I said, honey, they want me to do a gospel meeting out in Glen Burnie where Gary and Sandy, Calvin's family are, and I'm going, and I want you to go. And the first day, of course, she says, oh, are we driving? I said, no. <laughs> well, how about the train? I said, no, we're fine. And she finally agreed to do that. And we had everything all arranged. And I went out back in those days, and I, I used to run all the time, run, 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 run. And I'd go out early in the morning. And on that morning of 9-11, I came back, and usually she was awake, there might be a light on, and she'd have coffee going and so forth, there were a lot of lights on. And I come in the house, and we live in a reverse floor plan, so we can take advantage of the view that we used to have of the ocean. But in any case, as I'm coming up the stairs, Vicky says, Rent! She has the news on and the horrific things that take, had taken place. Y'all being three hours ahead of us, and we were getting it very early in the morning. And I threw her lunch with it. I said, I'm never going to get that girl on the plane. <laughs> but Gary and I talked. Gary said, and they had a couple of different elders at the time. He said, Let me talk and find out what's going to happen here, but maybe we can move it a month. And we made those arrangements and we did it. And I knew I'm going to be coming back here alone. And Vicky said, no, I'm going to go. And her first experience was on a little twin prop in <laughs> in Salus Abyssal. I just thought, oh, no. And she did well. And this is why I've said for a long time that my wife is one of the bravest people I know. Because when you have a phobia, and a phobia is a phobia, you can go ahead and give them statistics all day long of how safe it is, right? It doesn't make any difference. Not this way. What I'm just trying to say is that I myself even have a history with you to, to a certain degree, and this is like her eighth or ninth trip out here. I, I can't even remember to come out with you. And I just know, I know that the transition is not an easy thing to do. It's just not an easy thing to do. And there has to be a lot of thinking, there has to be a lot of planning that goes into it. So you've established yourself in this new location. You have several new members. I mean, I know there are some that are new Christians and and even as I heard Craig and some of the announcements, and you're looking hopefully to restore Christians and get people back. Maybe there's some that, that are new to the area. You have all of those dynamics that are going on. And with the passing of time and the development of this congregation, there's always been the need of exemplary leadership, spiritual leadership. Hopefully one day from elders and deacons to teachers and workers, and you'll always be in transition when it comes to that. And you need to be prepared for the future, which necessitates. To be prepared for the future necessitates immediate action. We don't prepare for the future in the future. That never is a plan that works well. <laughs> okay. So first of all, you're a congregation in transition. Secondly, and I ask by means of the question, are you mature enough to entertain the implications of this transition without feeling overburdened or discouraged. Absolutely, I believe, I believe, I believe that you are mature enough to entertain the implications, but it is going to be, and you've already experienced to a certain degree, and you have that sense of excitement, and it's kind of almost like a preacher moving to a new congregation. You kind of give them, you know, you know they give you like kind of the honeymoon time, right? And you have this excitement and you start a congregation and you have some people, yes, we can do this and we can do this. And will you be there? Yeah, I'll be there. We can do this. And people begin to step up, right? But then 
as the months begin to go and ensue, then all of a sudden some of the excitement is maybe gone. And the enthusiasm diminishes. And something has to happen to be able to keep that going. Some of you have heard me say this, and I believe this, and still do with all my heart, that in a congregation, you always need to have a rah-rah guy. Typically, that's the preacher because he's, I mean, he's the one that, that just spends a lot of time behind the pulpit and facing the congregation. And I've looked at that, and I've tried to look at that role, and I felt that much of my role as a gospel preacher and the congregations where I've had the privilege to serve, serve is to, to be able to, to continue to excite, to motivate, and to help keep people enthusiastic about who we are and what we're doing. <clears throat> now this is not to say that you do not need to be reminded of some important principles and to be spurred on to spiritual perfection. Though I know a lot of you are mature Christians. I remind you of an exhortation that is found in the book of Hebrews. In Hebrews in chapter 6 and verse 1, remember, in the preceding verses of chapter 5, 12 through 14, Hebrews 5, 12 through 14, that's that section that says, For when for the time you have to be teachers, you have to be the one teacher again, the first principles of the oracles of God. You become an aid of what? Of milk, not strong food, not meat, because that's for the mature. Some have failed to exercise themselves to spiritually where they can't even discern between good and evil. They should be here spiritual, but they're here. That's very sad. But he goes on to say in chapter 6, and just act as though there is no chapter division, because originally in the letter there wasn't. It's a running letter. But what we call chapter 6 and verse 1, he says, Therefore, therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on or let us move on to what? Perfection. Teleotis. Teleotis. It's from the Teleos family. Perfect, but perfection. But what it's really all about is maturity. To come to perfection really does not mean sinless. Never has meant that in Scripture. But it does mean completeness and maturity. And so this is the exhortation that the church of the Lord in any place, any area, needs to entertain and to appreciate. Let us move on. Let us go on to perfection. Now, having said all of that, I want you to consider Christ's statement of the church of Philadelphia. And what we're highlighting is verse number 8. And we're just a little off there. That's okay. But listen to it carefully or turn to your Bibles or turn to your phone or whatever the case is. But listen to it carefully. The Lord Jesus says to the church at Philadelphia, of whom he is commending, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. I'm going to read it again. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. A brief analysis, exegetically is in order. As we have already stated, Philadelphia was one of two faithful churches out of the seven of Smyrna. And we read about Smyrna, by the way, in chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. They were the ones that were told and commended for being faithful, but be faithful even to the point of death. Chapter 2, verse 10. But I want you to think about one of the things that's said, with it, in fact, it's made it here, that for you have a little strength. Now, one might be tempted to look at that and say, oh, a little strength. You know, we're, we're talking about being Strong, I mean, we're talking about not a little strength, a lot of strength. Isn't that, isn't that important? But it's used very idiomatically, without question. And little strength was not an indication of their spiritual character. When we consider the phrases that follow, you have kept my word and have not denied my name. That could not be said of some of the other congregations. Therefore, a little strength or power. And the expression that we have there is micron dunamin. 
of little strength, but little power. Again, is an idiom that does not indicate the spiritual quality of these individuals. But it may very well be an idiom indicating their size, especially when compared to the pagan and Jewish influences surrounding them at that time historically. One of the most important things that we can do in a study of the book of Revelation and looking at these seven churches of Asia, and this is a fabulous study, and I love doing even homiletic series on this too, that is taking just those and putting it to sermons, to sermons of the seven churches of Asia. And that when you study all seven of those churches and those cities and where they are geographically and within their history, and to look at their business and their industry and their philosophy, and you do the study, and there's some fabulous works out there that really does a good job with that. Uh, Brother Homer Hades commentary on Revelation is a classic and I think it's one of the best when it comes to the background of Roman civilization and of all the kings, but he does a good job with that. Uh, I really appreciate that and have the opportunity to know Brother Haley and, 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 and he signed all, all the books that he wrote that I have of his and just was a, a wonderful, wonderful man, an incredible student of God's word. But looking at that, when you look at, at, at this, when you study all of these cities, you'll find that the language, the phrases, the terminology, and the metaphors that are given to all seven churches are very, very peculiar, specific to those cities and where, where they were, what they did, what they were known for. You see what I'm saying? And this is true of Philadelphia as well. Philadelphia was not called Philadelphia because they were a city of brotherly love. We can go ahead and say that's what happened in Philadelphia, PA, and I don't know, you know, their background. But the reason why it was called Philadelphia had nothing to do with people that loved each other. It was named after the king whose name was Philadelphus. All right. Pagan king. And it was a known Macedonian city, Roman city. A great notoriety. But when you think of what was going on, is that the Christians, and maybe we get this idea somehow that these congregations in, in these seven cities were, were huge congregations, and that is not necessarily so. Ephesus may have been a larger congregation, as we talked about there the other evening, but it seems to be the indication here that at least comparatively speaking of what was going on in that city, that these Christians that were meeting in Philadelphia were of little power, little strength by virtue, they weren't great in numbers. Maybe even those among their leadership were not any men of great notoriety and people of understanding. And, you know, they certainly didn't, doesn't appear to have any apostles that were there. John had been at Ephesus for a period of time. We don't know apostles that resided or spent any time in Philadelphia, not that I know, historically. <clears throat> Here's what I want us to see out of this, at least to think about. It may not have been the biggest church in town. But the candlestick was still glowing bright. You're all familiar with that, of course, that the admonition, the rebuke and the admonition that given to these churches and to the five in particular that needed to repent. And they needed to do that or else what? The Lord would remove their candlestick. And the candlestick was the very idea, the symbol, the metaphor of their being in right relationship with God and glowing bright and being giving forth the truth from who they are, the work that they were doing. And so when we look at this, we go back, and he says, See, I have set before you an open door. And again, it is the open door statement that I really want to elucidate. I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. Now, there are times that messages are given like that by God, by the Lord to people, in this very positive vein, that I will give you this open door, no one can shut it. When the Lord provides an opportunity, that's a wonderful thing. And what he's showing is that if we will do what we're supposed to do, there's nobody else who's going to come and say, no, and just shut it. If the Lord opens the door and we decide that we're going to follow the Lord and do his will, I believe his will can be accomplished and great things can be done. But it's up to us to do the right thing. That's marvelous, in my eyes, anyway, in my estimation. 
It is Christ who provides the doors of opportunity to grow, to develop, to be a significant voice in the community, regardless of the opposition and regardless of, and I'm going to tell you this is going to be true, of most fellowships around the planet. Listen, in our fellowships, very rarely are we going to be the biggest in town. And even in congregations that have congregations in the country that, you know, may have several hundred members. You just go ahead and compare those with some of the massive denominations and it doesn't begin to compare. But you know what? That's not what it's all about. It's not numbers, obviously, for the sake of numbers. So no one can shut it certainly refers to outside influences. In other words, we only have ourselves to blame. If we do not seize, that is, we do not apprehend the opportunities that the Lord places in front of us. That's my message. And I ask you, has the Lord placed opportunities in front of you? Has the Lord provided an open door? I believe he has. And by the way, I preach this sermon basically. In Los Osos in July of 2007. And the reason why I did that, and that's a number of years ago, right, is because we did something that it took a lot of decision, a lot of work and planning when we left Cayucas, but the whole congregation came because well, we ran out of room and parking, but we moved to Los Osos. And it was just a big change in a lot of different ways. And there were some people, can we do this? Can we do this? And I appreciate the elders then so much and said, yes, we can and we will. And by the way, in no time, and by the way, California, <laughs> California, well, California again is not all that dissimilar from Maryland or vice versa. It's expensive here too. And real estate's expensive. And the cost of building is expensive. And we live in a very politically, very liberal state. And we're in a county that just fights you tooth and toenail to try to develop anything. And it took us three years to get a building permit. <laughs> we want to break ground so badly. And they said, well, first thing we've got to do is you've got to pay us $3,600 to make to, to look out so we can go out and comb the property because of the California striped snow. Okay. So the fellow shows up, and Jack was sure was one of our elders at the time. He shows up, and there he is. He gets out of the car and he puts the plot map on the hood of the car. He doesn't leave, he does not leave his car. He looks and he says, wait a minute, San Luis Creek is right there, is it not? We said yes. He says, You're not even in the zone. We can sign it off for $1,800 right now. Well, if we're not in the zone, why are we even doing this at all? But we'd rather, rather than fight it, we'd pay $3,600. We gave him $1,800 bucks and called it a day. But it just seemed like every time we turned around, there was going to be something, some kind of obstacle. There are a lot of obstacles that, that come about. That's the, town, the, the town is not a city. It's not even an incorporated area. But they put a new sewer, and they were doing it. And that, 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 that community was fighting like cats and dogs. It made national news because of riots, because of problems. We had to be approved by LOCAP, the Los Osos community that, that would go ahead, an advisory committee that would go ahead and report to the county. And I want to tell you what, that we met before them, and two times they voted in our favor nine to one, but yet these, these, this minority, they fought us and fought us and took us, and we thought, is there no end in this? We met and surpassed every study they gave us. Although I did say when we thought they were going to talk about snail, we get the snails. I said, let's go out the day before you find any now. Let's just check me into the other side. <laughs> but we didn't do that. <laughs> I never got to see one of those snails there. <laughs> no one can shut it. And the Lord opened it for us. I want to say, with the sincerest humility that I can muster, and it's for all of us, unless any of us, should become puffed up. That in many respects, and I say to you that you are in the place of Philadelphia, a church in transition with an open door set before you. You really are. And you know what the rest of this is? The rest of this 
this is what we've been talking about for two and a half days, and we're going to breeze through this because we're going to be done. What time do we start? Five o'clock? Yeah, we're done. We're almost done. Man, can you imagine eating a potluck like that, doing all that, lounging out by the pool and coming here and have to listen to a sermon? <laughs> Bless your hearts. <laughs> See, I thought the potluck was going to be on Saturday. Have our morning sessions, potluck, we can just all flake and not worry about it. And we said, oh no, we're doing it on, 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 on Sunday after services. And I said, what time are we meeting on Sunday? Five o'clock. And I thought, oh no. <laughs> I had prepared a, a whole group of jokes for you, but I... <laughs> I just say to you, this week, there we go. The open door for personal development. This is what we've been talking about, and we just go through this because these are the things we've been saying. First of all, you have an opportunity of a commitment to spiritual growth, but you've got to look at this and open the door for personal development. Take this very personally. Everyone take it personally. <laughs> now, I don't want you to take it personally from the standpoint of, well, I'm offended because, you know, you're kind of talking straight about some things. Man, you're talking about family, you're talking about this and that. All I can tell you is take it personally. And that requires honesty and integrity of heart. Because this is an opportunity of commitment to spiritual growth. I will say this, I love in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1 and 3, 1 through 3. There when Peter had first told them to lay aside, 1 Peter chapter 2, 1 in the beginning, lay aside all malice, all guile, hypocrisy, evil, and all the evil speaking, get rid of that, mainly doing, dealing with the impurities of speech. But I love in verse 2 and 3, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word. Peter uses milk differently than what the Hebrew writer did. The Hebrew writer was talking about milk from the standpoint that they could not handle strong meat. Here, this is a simple analogy. You desire, you desire the spiritual milk of God's word. You desire the, the truth as much as a baby desires its mother's milk. That's the metaphor. How much do you desire? And this is, brethren, all I can tell you is why we've got to get our noses in this all the time. We need to be reading this. We need to be studying this. This is something that needs to be done on a regular basis. And you have an opportunity, an open door to a commitment to spiritual growth. But look at verse 3 when it says, If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, that the Lord is favorable, is good. If indeed. Preachers can preach sermons to a group of people, and everybody's hearing the same sermon, but they may be hearing it differently. And if some come up and say, oh man, thank you so much, I was challenged by that, I needed that, that was good, we need that, and just appreciate it. And, and maybe they've been rebuked, and maybe they've been challenged, and then somebody else comes up and says, who do you think you are talking to us that way? If indeed the Lord tastes gracious to you. If it tastes bitter, I apologize if it's my fault. If it tastes bitter because the truth is difficult and hurts, repent. Personal development, developing talents for the Lord. How many times have we go to the parable of talents? It's a judgment parable in Matthew chapter 25. And this master gives these servants these, these talents of five and two and one, and we know what happens. And, he doubles and the other doubles and the other takes a towel and goes out and buries it. And there's just a number of spiritual applications to that in Matthew 25. But I'd say it, just looking at it in a very simple, simple situation, we look at this, is that we are a gifted, talented people. We're given talents and we need to develop those talents for the Lord. That's a responsibility. We have this opportunity before us to do that. And as we talked about in one of this morning's lessons, we have these gifts differing. Romans 12, 6, according to the grace given us. Let us use them. And brethren, I'm just telling you, develop your talents. And if you think, well, you know, I do this pretty well. We can even do it. We, well, you know what? We all have room for improvement. We can all develop more. Right? And dependability and faithfulness. What an opportunity. An open door for the personal development of dependability. I love the expression faithfulness. Faithfulness. You know, faith is a belief, faith is a trust, faith is a conviction, but faithful or faithfulness is a quality that deals with trustworthiness or dependability. You know, why is it that, you know, I don't really know anybody that ever had a dog named him Fido, but you hear that, you know, in stories. Fido, right? Fido. Did everybody know where that comes from? Latin? Any, any Marines here? Semper Fi? Fidelity? 
Right? Always faithful. Old faithful. Yellowstone. I've seen it. You know his count? How many times do you find in the expression in the Old Testament that God is faithful? Does that mean that God believes a lot of things? Well, I may have mentioned before, God believes nothing. He knows everything. The idea for us to be dependability or faithfulness, this is something that, in other words, where we can be counted upon. We're all stewards in certain ways. We're stewards of God's work. We're stewards that he has made us stewards within the church of the Lord. We get that. And what is 1 Corinthians 4, 2? Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful, dependent. Brethren, I'm going to ask you, each and every one of you, to take this to heart, to take it personally. Can you really be dependent upon? And as they say, excuse the expression, when the chips are down, can you be counted? Mm -hmm. I think some people just don't understand. And what I do, and one thing I share with the guys that, that I've had the opportunity to train for many years is all the fellows will tell you with Brent, in fact, one fellow made me a t-shirt and a cup and a hat and does it all. Called it the Brent Bully School Evangelism, and the logo was Communication is the Name of the Game. <laughs> Communication is the Name of the Game. Can we be dependent upon? And I'm going to tell you, if you can't be here, communicate that. You're given a job to do, and something happens, let somebody know. Can you be dependent upon? To do what you've been asked for. You can't give me dependent upon. To be on time. It drives me wild. I'm just going to be real honest with you. I'll tell you. I used to be in management, restaurant management. And being late once, not good, twice, three times they're gone. Sometimes I don't think that we treat the Lord the way that we would have to treat our employer or boss because we don't. You know what that is? That's dependability. Good better. Enough said. Can we depend? And then there's always going to be, and I've talked about this and kind of dead made it, preparing for leadership roles. Yes, you're going to need, you know, in Titus 1.5, what did Paul tell Titus? Titus was preaching on the island of Greek. And he's, and he's dealing with numerous congregations. And Paul tells Titus, in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, he says to set in order the things that are lacking, ordain or appoint elders in every city. And I know that's something that you'll be working on, but that, what I'm really talking about, is that to always look to see, are there things that are lacking? Are there things that need to be, to be done, need to be done better? Are there things that need to be changed? But we've got to look at this very, very seriously, and this is why we know that, that elders who are, are shepherds, that are bishops, who are overseers, <coughs> they're shepherding the flock, but they need to do this because there has been something that's been entrusted to them. That's what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 3 to the elders. This has been entrusted, nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And I'll just say to you all, to all of you, that we all need to be examples. You know, deacons, would it, why, why are they called deacons? Diakonos. Do you know how diakonos is typically translated? Servant. It's not just a title. Because it's expressive in helping others, taking care of situations. You know, when it comes to teaching and preaching, and I know many of you are stepping up and wanting to do that, and, and, and just 2 Timothy 2 2. Paul said to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, he says, Timothy, the things that you have heard of me, among many witnesses, the same commit to who? Faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And what you find in there is a built-in perpetuity that it is to be perpetual. The faithful men teaching others. The faithful men teaching others. The things Timothy have heard and Timothy teaches one and he's faithful and he will teach others and others and others. And that's what we need. And we need to be able to depend upon a core of individuals who appreciate that. Preparing for leadership roles. And all of us, is you, to, to lead the congregation in worship, in prayer, in the Lord's Supper, in song leading, and all of those things because it's needed so it just doesn't fall on a couple of people or all of a sudden, last minute, they realize, what are we going to do? 
let's not run the business of the church, <laughs> as Marie Sanchez used to say, by the seat of our pants. And let's have exemplary lives before others. Jesus said in the Sermon of the Mount, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, what? Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works. And glorify your fathers in heaven. It's never about self-aggrandizement. It's never about self. It's about honoring and glorifying the Father that we are to be the best examples that we can. And so I say there are open, there's an open door for personal development, and each and every one of us need to take that very personally of the congregation. And that will help in the open door the Lord provides and for ensuing success. Then there's the open door for effective evangelism. I'm from California, location, location, location. And y'all heard that certainly before, especially in real estate jargon. Thought Wayne would get appreciated, appreciate that. I didn't know what he did until I think just today or yesterday somebody said real estate and uh, one of those guys. But anyway, he's not here to defend himself. So maybe, maybe he's like, is he like streaming? Anyway. You know, <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that was awesome today because we found out we have these commonality and friends and with the Hanks and with Wayne and Mary and so forth, that particularly in David and Willie Hilbert, oh my word, and we start talking about that. And so it was, that was a marvelous moment and we just had so many things to talk about. And the other thing, too, Mary said, man, you are old school. She said, you're preaching. You are old school. She said, I haven't heard this kind of preaching in a long time. Is that a compliment? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's okay. No, she meant it in a very complimentary way. But <laughs> I want to say to you, an open door has been set before you, perhaps more than ever, or at least for a long time. This is a big area. I mean, with Vicky and I, see, when Vicky and I come out here, See, I know we're out here, you're out in the country and meeting in a, what we call the barn. But you, you do this. But the thing is, the fact is, is that when we start going in, and even going to Ellicott City, and you've got these freeways that kind of go like this and all that, we don't have that where we come from. We just don't. And, and all I can say is you've got this thriving, really, in our estimation, metropolitan area, greater Baltimore and Glen Burnie and all these other towns. Brethren, there's enough room and opportunity for there to be multiple congregations in these counties. Would you not agree? So when we talk about location, I believe, and in picking in what I know of the demographic, I don't know much about it, some things have been said to me, Ellicott City seems to be a really, really good choice. God bless you for that, and I hope that works well. But what does it come down to? Because it's out there. The harvest is plenty. But the labor is few. And we've got to get together. That's what Jesus said, of course, in Matthew 9, 37. And so he said in verse 38, Therefore pray the Lord that the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And I just say, even from the standpoint of the congregation collectively effective evangelism, do take it very personally. You know, it used to be said of, old school preaching. <laughs> but in Matthew 28, when the old King James said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel in, in Mark 16 and 15, excuse me. But go ye into all the world and preach the gospel of every creature. Go ye. You know, the old King James wording that I heard preachers all the time when I was a kid growing up. Go ye means go me. <laughs> well, grammatically it really doesn't. But anyway, <laughs> but in principle it can. Okay. That's okay, my kids grew up with it. I said, we're dead, we're dead, and a grand Nazi. But anyway. <laughs> but we do need to take that personally. To take it very personally that we can, and, and that we need to get excited about sharing Jesus with others. And I'll tell you what, even, and start with your own family. Start with your own family. I want to see my, I want to see, I want to go to heaven. I want to see my spouse go to heaven. And I have a wonderful spouse, and she's a great Christian. In fact, in some years, she's a, she's a better Christian than I am. In so many ways, it's not even funny. I want to see my children go to heaven. My grandchildren. Oh, I want them to get good educations. And I tell lifestyles of people today, I tell kids today, why are you wasting money in college? Buy a smartphone. 
call it a day. But, <laughs> but I want them to have all those things and the joys of life and so forth. But I want to see them go to heaven. <coughs> have good friends. <coughs> friends I've had since high school, but I want to see them go to heaven. But we have to, one, take it personally, and then two, take it to personally to our own personal family, our own personal friends to see this. But I love that the commendation was given of, by God to Abraham in Genesis 18, 19. God says, for I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may be, bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. That's amazing. God says, I have known him. God entrusted Abraham with so much. Do any of you have this maybe on a plaque in your house somewhere? <laughs> Choose you this day whom you will serve. <laughs> okay. Joshua 24, 15. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served, which were on the other side of the river, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you have dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. As far as methods are concerned, methodology, and that's be involved, there's something for all of us to do. I realize that geographically and sometimes with traffic and all those things, there can be difficulties in this. But I'm telling you what, you have personal contacts, home, have home Bible studies, get involved with sharing the gospel. And when you do find a preacher, get one that knows how to work. Get one that knows how to be responsible and accountable. Accountable in his time. For 43 years. And I'm not trying to puff myself up in this, but I'll tell you who I got this one was Moriestus, by the way. And right now, presently, and this has been going on forever, I teach 10 to 12 home Bible classes every week. Every week. Our night times are Bible classes. Our Saturday mornings are Bible classes. My Saturday afternoon are Bible classes. I have Bible classes, three Bible classes in the morning. And for a long time, on Wednesdays at 6 a.m., Thursdays at 6.45, and Fridays at 7.30. Fellows that want to, to, to have a Bible study before they go to work. I did a Wednesday morning breakfast club where I had 8, 10 guys from home fix them breakfast at 5.36 o'clock in the morning. And then we studied, but we studied the Minor Prophets, we studied the Book of Revelation. But I want to tell you what this does. Get a fellow that knows how to roll up the stage and go to work, not just preach some sermons. That will be accountable and get out there and motivate people. Because it, what it does is it encourages and it produces enthusiasm. I remember Maury way back and saying to people, what are you doing Tuesday night? What are you doing Thursday night? What are you doing? He said, Brent, what are you doing? I was trying to finish college. I was working. I was taking anywhere from... From, from 16 to 21 units per quarter, working 40 hours a week, was married at 19, and Maury says, Brent, I want you to be involved in some Bible classes. Well, what do I get to do in my spare time, Maury? But I'll tell you what he says on fire. And don't quench the spirit. All right, we're done. You know, when he completed his, that's Jesus, when he completed his seven letters to the seven churches, what the Lord said, you find it at the end of all of this. We're going to go there first. In Revelation 3 and verse 20. <coughs> this for all I can complete all the letters. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and die with him. And he Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Open the door. And let him in while there's opportunity. We're going to sing the song of invitation. Uh, who at my door is standing, correct? Who at my door is standing? I think that's only appropriate. If we can help and assist and encourage anyone in whatever need, I thank you again for your marvelous, your marvelous attention. But before us, the open door. And you're an open door church without question. Why don't you come as we stand? Later on.